As you take your seats, uh, it's okay. let me uh, first of all uh, welcome uh, and thank uh, all of you for being here. And uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, in particular the many delegations that this year are present at ministerial level. Uh, I take it as uh, an encouraging sign, uh, those from the region, uh, those from uh, uh, the Astana group, uh, those from uh, uh, the neighboring countries, uh, and I would like to in particular recognize uh, the foreign ministers of uh, Turkey and Jordan, uh, but I know also that the foreign minister of Lebanon is joining us, uh, and uh, the presence of uh, uh, members of the Security Council uh, and of many EU member states. I think this gives us uh, a good, uh, um, a good uh, platform uh, to try and advance on uh, our support to uh, the political process that we see it's needed in, uh, in Syria. I would also like to welcome uh, the representatives of Syrian civil society uh, who have joined us today and that will uh, uh, address uh, us uh, later to bring an important perspective uh, that for us is the most important one the one of the Syrian people, uh, because if we are here today is uh, uh, to serve them and to try and achieve peace in the country uh, so that they can uh, uh, live normal lives again. Uh, the war in Syria is not over yet. With these words, I opened our meeting exactly one year ago. And sadly, these words are still true today. We all took a sigh of relief when another massacre was avoided in Idlib after the deal between Turkey and Russia. And I would like to thank their engagement in this respect. Yet, the risk of an offensive remains. And I believe the first objective we share today is to call on the Astana guarantors who are present here to safeguard the last remaining de-escalation zone. And beyond Idlib, Syria is still not at peace. The conflict is evolving, it's changing. And its regional dimension is even stronger than in the past, and this worries us. Syria is divided. Millions of people are still displaced inside the country and outside of the country. There is no winner in this war. There might be military victories, but there is no winner in this war. Certainly not the people of Syria who are paying the highest price. And let me mention in particular the women of Syria that have shown an incredible courage, determination and wisdom. And nobody will win, neither the war nor the peace, without a negotiated political solution. And this is why, uh, just after my opening remarks, I will be honored and pleased to pass the floor to Staffan de Mistura. A negotiated political solution that opens the way towards a united, independent, democratic, and inclusive Syria. A negotiated political solution can only emerge in the United Nations framework, and this is why we're having this meeting here today in this framework of the General Assembly. And I'm glad to see that a new international consensus is emerging on this very basic idea that has always been at the center of the European Union work on Syria and for Syria. But only together we can help put Staffan's work back on track and make sure that the Constitutional Committee can start concentrating on substance in Geneva. Starting the political process, Staffan uh, has uh, all our full support. He knows that. This has always been the case. This will continue to be the case. You can be sure that our only goal, our only agenda, our only objective as European Union is to support the United Nations mediation and to help start meaningful negotiations towards a political solution. And with this goal in mind, I am glad to announce our intention to host a third Brussels conference on the future of Syria and the region. I would like to invite you all to the third Brussels conference on the last week of March next year, hoping that by then we will be in condition to gather and mobilize international and regional support to a political process that by then, hopefully, inshallah, will be underway. 
The Brussels II conference last uh, spring was crucial to raise humanitarian support for the Syrian people. And this is something we will address in the second part of our meeting today. Humanitarian support for the Syrian people, but also for the host communities. And I'm proud to tell you that we have already delivered on 95% of the pledges that were done in Brussels last spring. We have kept our word to the Syrian people and to Syria's neighbors. And I think this consistency is relevant for the credibility of the work that lies ahead of us. We've proven this credibility to be there on the humanitarian side. I hope and I believe we have the space for doing the same on the political side of our work. Next year, expect our conference to be, hopefully, depending on uh, the work that will happen or not on the UN auspices, more focused on the political support and the support we can mobilize to accompany negotiations, but also expect the conference to be a Syrian week, providing the stage for the best part of the Syrian society. Because too often we discuss of Syria, but not with the Syrians. It will be a stage for Syrian women, for Syrian youth, and for Syria civil society that has survived through these seven years of war, saving lives and the very possibility of life in Syria. They are Syria, and the future of Syria must be in their hands, not ours. Syria today is still very far from being the peaceful, democratic, and inclusive country where all Syrians can feel at home. Every Syrian dreams to go back home. Every time we talk with any of the men and women and children that we meet outside of Syria or inside Syria, they tell us this. And we can only support this dream. Let me thank once again the host communities, particularly in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, but also in Egypt and Iraq and in Europe. Our common goal is to create the conditions for a safe and dignified return of all Syrians to their land. Still today, most Syrians simply don't have a home to go back to. Their properties are being confiscated, and many would risk forced conscription or unlawful arrest. And I am glad we will hear more uh, from uh, uh, Grande, from the UNHCR, because we would trust their assessment and their work, and we would support their assessment and their work on uh, the creation of the conditions for the Syrian refugees to go return home. Last but not least, we Europeans are willing to contribute to the reconstruction, but a political solution must be underway. Most Syrians don't want to go back to a country where there is no accountability and where political detainees are still in jail. The people of Syria ask for the end of the war and for a negotiated political solution. And this would be, we believe, the only realistic basis for a sustainable peace, because military victory does not necessarily imply winning the peace. The people of Syria want and need a negotiated political solution. And let me conclude on a positive note. Against all odds, I believe a political solution is still possible, and we could be very close to achieving it, but only if we all work to make it happen. This is the moment to pull all our weight in support of the UN process, of your work, Stefan, so that we can finally see the beginning of the end of the Syrian world. I thank you very much for your presence, for your attention, and I would pass immediately the floor to Stefan de Mistura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Federica, for uh, the organizing this, hosting this event, and for the words you just said. Uh, this is a very timely meeting and an important one at the moment. The UN and the EU have had an exemplary cooperation since the very beginning of my mandate and even before. And uh, I welcome very much your intention to be persistent and also have a new Brussels conference. Because uh, we need to review every year where we are, but also to launch new initiatives. Clearly, Syria is very much on the agenda of both EU and the UN, and rightly so. So I will not discuss about many things. I will just focus on two priorities, if you allow me. The first one is uh, civilians. Civilians, civilians, Syrian civilians. Protection, humanitarian assistance, access, funding, 
we will hear it from Mark Lockerg and from you, Filippo, how much this is upfront and should be our priority. In that context, Idlib. Idlib is a main priority and will remain so for reasons that you're all familiar. The civilians of Idlib have raised their voices, particularly women, actually, and you raised, uh, and I refer to them because we saw them with our own eyes. Uh, and many of you in this room have raised your own voices regarding the fate of the civilians in Idlib. And these voices have contributed to what has been a very remarkable uh, uh, MOU. Those voices have been heard and should be heard even in the future. The recent Russian-Turkish deal is welcome, very much welcome. I think where we were about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we were waiting to see the worst case scenario. And we look forward, therefore, to its implementation. We hope that all sides will continue to engage in good faith, putting protection of civilians first and looking to address the threat of terrorism strictly in accordance with international humanitarian law. We must also be vigilant for obvious reasons because the constant danger of international escalation. We had those winds coming up when the Idlib crisis appeared not to be solving itself. Despite this risk, let's not miss this opportunity. There is a chance for open conflict to win down. It's not over, the conflict is still there, but there is a chance to help it. And major players we know are talking. That brings me to our second priority, the political process or the political solution. Today, the government has strengthened its position against terrorism. We know that, so there is no reason for it not them feeling more at ease to actually engage in a political process. And all sides have been receptive to a constitutional process. We also heard that on the occasion of the MOU, both the President Putin and President Erdogan both said this is a window of opportunity to be used for accelerating the political process. Logically, that would mean that real talks can begin and common ground could start to be found. Now, we have identified, out of 2254, which still remains the main point, a vehicle to begin this process. It is a UN-facilitated, Syrian-owned, Syrian-led constitutional committee. The government and the opposition delegations have been identified and accepted. And a balanced list of Syrian civil society experts, independents, tribal leaders, and women have been put together by us. The UN has carefully and flexibly consulted on that list and on the rules of procedure. So in theory, we could be starting next week. We can, and there is no reason not to do it in October. Imagine the signal, dear friends, it would send if in the next months we could start a constitutional commission, which had been announced anyway already eight months ago during a very important meeting that took place in Sochi, which the UN participated to. That could be a stepping stone to a new social contract and to broader steps to create a safer, calmer, more neutral environment leading to UN-supervised presidential and parliamentary elections as per Resolution 2254. This is not just a mantra, it's a true possibility, Federica, and you're right in saying we should not miss this opportunity. It is precisely now, when we have stepped back from the confrontation in Idlib, that we should be saying, let us put this real political process in place and build some confidence building around it. Frankly, dear friends, the Syrian people have the right to expect that, especially at this moment. And there is no doubt at all that if that process goes moving and was generally delivering, it would help unlock many, many other things. That is why everyone will look now to see if this Constitutional Committee can move in October, not in Christmas, not next year, in October. That is why we are going to push for that.
And to make it move, let us also not forget there is a need to build some confidence. Will detainees now finally start becoming released? We shall talk about it, and we have been talking about it for now many months. Let's see if it starts happening. Will law number 10 and similar legislation be indeed suspended so that housing, land, property is properly addressed? There is a solid discussion on this between our team in Damascus and the government of Syria, but we would like to see some conclusion on it and some real results. Will refugees have the confidence to return home because they see some sort of genuine change taking place, some political vision taking place? After all, this is not only a question of bricks and mortar, but confidence. The political process can provide that one if we put it in action. The political process must ultimately, and we all know it, and we will always say so, help to restore ultimately the Syrian sovereignty, unity, independence, and territorial integrity. And Syrians must lead the effort. But the Syrians themselves are asking us to help them to find a way out of this conflict. They need to be helped and encouraged by all of you. And frankly, the UN needs your help too. That's why thank you for doing this today. Help means help. It means friendly advice, yes, we are getting it. Good ideas, yes. But at some point it means generally supporting the UN when it seeks on your behalf to move the process ahead after many, many months of extensive consultation. So we are in that period now. And I trust I can continue to reach out to each of you in order to get this type of support. In this way, I believe we can see a balanced and credible constitutional committee up and running. It will take time, but it will be starting moving and create some new dynamic in what otherwise a process that is so far being very slow. I said at the beginning of last month that we were getting close to a moment of truth. Dear friends, that's exactly what we are saying. The Idlib deal gives us a moment of hope, but also a window of opportunity not to be missed. Federica, I really want to say once again how much we have been feeling constantly accompanied by you personally, and by your team, and your member countries in what is a common goal. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I take this uh, uh, applause as a sign of uh, encouragement, recognition, but also as a commitment from all of us uh, to help you in, uh, uh, in your uh, role. Um, I have the difficult task now to remind us all that we should try to stick to the three minutes. Uh, and I'll pass immediately the floor to the Foreign Minister of Turkey, Mevlut Çavuşoglu, to take the floor. Thank you very much. Commissioner, dear Federica, Stefan, thank you very much for the update. Despite some progress, unfortunately, the conflict in Syria continues to be a major challenge in our region and even beyond. For almost eight years, we have been witnessing the direct impact of the crisis in our uh, common security and stability. As neighboring countries, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, had more than their fair share in shouldering multidimensional responsibilities. As the largest refugee hosting uh, country, Turkey hosts around 3.5 million Syrians, and we have spent almost 32 billion uh, US dollars. We welcome the EU's 3 plus 3 billion uh, euro commitments within the framework of the facility for refugees in Turkey, and uh, out of 2 billion uh, you know, uh, euros dispersed, but we are uh, working together how to speed up this process on both sides. I think as it is in the uh, agreement uh, deal that we signed, we should use this money for the daily living expenses of uh, the refugees, particularly for the healthcare services. And dear colleagues, today we are at another critical juncture, Idlib, our determination and continued engagement with Russia and Iran produced positive results and a looming uh, catastrophe has been prevented. Uh, 
In Sochi, we signed a memorandum to stabilize the situation in Idlib, and we agreed on the preservation of Idlib's status as a de-escalation area. Thus, we uh, saved uh, thousands of innocent lives and preempted a potential influx of millions of refugees towards our borders and even Europe. We are now working with the Russians and Iranians on how to implement the memorandum. And this afternoon, we are going to have trilateral ministerial with uh, my brother Zarif and Sergei uh, Lavrov. Sustained engagement of the international community will be needed in ensuring full compliance by the regime. The Idlib memorandum has opened a new window of opportunity, uh, and we should benefit from the relative calm to speed up the political uh, track. In this connection, the Constitutional Committee must be established without further delay, and this requires a credible and balanced structure. This is what we are trying to do in our consultation with uh, UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mistra. I think we should all together uh, uh, support his uh, efforts, and he has been doing a good job. And on these issues of return of refugees and reconstruction, we also see a correlation with progress in the political process. However, the correlation should be a dynamic and simultaneous rather than static and conditional in nature. We need to support the uh, people who are voluntarily returning uh, the country. Reconstruction of the country is something else. Uh, assisting the uh, refugees and IDPs going back to their home is something else. It's t totally different. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mevlut. I now give the floor uh, to the Deputy Foreign Minister uh, of the Russian Federation, uh, Sergei Vershinin, uh, reminding uh, you that you have translation from Russian on Channel uh, 1. I will then give the floor to the F Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Iran, uh, Javad Zarif. Thank you so much. I will speak in Russian. And as you said, we have this translation. Thank you so much. Уважаемые дамы и господа, наша встреча проходит на фоне чрезвычайно ответственного и важного этапа в процессе урегулирования сирийского кризиса. В течение этого месяца состоялось сразу несколько значимых мероприятий, которые оказали стабилизирующее влияние на ситуацию в Сирии. Прежде всего, я имею в виду подписание президентами России и Турции 17 сентября в Сочи меморандума о стабилизации обстановки в зоне деэскалации Идлиб. Данное соглашение направлено на укрепление режима прекращения боевых действий, на отделение формирования вооруженной оппозиции, готовой встать на, политический, на путь политического регулирования от террористов, на продолжение борьбы с террористами, обеспечение защиты и безопасности мирных граждан. Это уже дает свой, свою отдачу. Убеждены, что выполнение меморандума будет способствовать снятию напряженности вокруг Идлибской зоны деэскалации, предотвращению неконтролируемой эскалации насилия и противодействию исходящей оттуда террористической угрозе. Необходимо отметить, что сочинские договоренности получили поддержку Дамаска, представителей внутренней и внешней сирийской оппозиции, Ирана и большинства международных э, игроков, большинства членов международного сообщества. Вместе с тем, не последнюю роль в нагнетании напряженности вокруг Идлиба играли и играют, не прекращающиеся угрозы нанести удар возмездия в ответ на якобы применение Дамаском химических отравляющих веществ. Again and again, we are directing the attention of the international community that it is necessary to put an end to these dangerous provocations, jeopardizing the promise of reaching a political and diplomatic solution of Syrian crisis. Our position remains consistent and unchanged. Syrian conflict, as well as other regional crises, does not have a military solution and can be settled only through a negotiation political process. This crucial understanding was reiterated during the third summit in Astana on the 7th of September in Tehran.
Presidents of Russia, Iran and Turkey have expressed preparedness to continue active cooperation in the interests of promotion of political process led and conducted by the Syrians themselves. According to the decisions of the Congress for Syrian National Dialogue in Sochi and Resolution of the UN Security Council 2254, the three grantor states will continue joint efforts to shape Constitutional Committee in Geneva. In consultations with the Stefan de Mistura, UN Security, uh, UN uh, Special Representative, to truly launch the comprehensive political process so needed by Syria, Middle Eastern region, and the whole international community. It is apparent that as the situation in Syria is stabilizing, the front stage is taken by, by post-conflict rehabilitation and protection of rights of refugees and IDPs to return. We have to ensure a safe, voluntary and decent process of returning of Syrians to the, their homeland. In this regard, support of the international community, that is, providing additional humanitarian assistance, ensuring rebuilding of socio-economic infrastructure, providing new projects that would provide jobs for those returning, all that is of utmost importance. We cannot allow for the long-awaited pivot of the country to normal and regular life to become hostage to artificially set politicized conditions and policies. It's high time it was understood that unilateral sanctions bring detriment not to the Syrian government but to regular civilians. This is a vicious and dead-end practice, not only in Syrian but in any other situation. Russia will continue to actively provide assistance to Syria, both on political and humanitarian tracks. Since September 2015, with our help, more than 30,000 houses and 5,000 educational and 150 medical facilities were rebuilt and renovated. 1,935 humanitarian actions also took place. Russian military doctors provided medical assistance to 93,000 Syrians. Russian engineers and minesweepers have conducted large-scale demining actions in different parts of Syria, including world cultural heritage sites in Palmyra, Bosra, old city of Damascus and Aleppo. We are convinced that today all responsible members of the international community and the UN member states are faced with a complicated tasks to provide assistance to Syria and Syrian nation to overcome detrimental consequences of war, elimination of last hotspots of terrorism, returning to normal, peaceful life. We expect that we will be thankful to those considering these tasks, including everyone in the European Union. Uh, thank you for these efforts, and we expect that such efforts will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll give the floor to the Foreign Minister of Iran, uh, Javad Zarif, followed by France. Thank you very much, Federica. Thank you for convening this meeting, and also thanks to Stefan de Mistura for his uh, comprehensive briefing to, to all of us. Uh, since my colleagues from Turkey and Russian Federation already briefed you on the Astana process and the achievements that we have had since the summit in Tehran, as well as the work that we've done in order to make sure that the uh, catastrophe that could have happened uh, in Idlib uh, was uh, averted, I hope, uh, we need to address uh, the important fundamental issues that are at stake. First, uh, those principles that we, ha we have all agreed upon, the principle of respect for serious territorial integrity, national unity, and national sovereignty. These uh, should be not principles that we simply continue to reiterate, but principles that we agree to implement in action and on the ground. And that is an important task that we all need to take into consideration. The second is to combat terrorism uh, and extremism in Syria. This is a threat to all of us. We just felt part of that threat uh, this Saturday in Tehran when uh, a group affiliated with these extremist groups uh, opened fire on innocent civilians. We need to be careful about this. All of us have experienced it, and we need to be very meticulous in dealing with this. The area uh, around Idlib uh, is populated by Nusra fighters, and we need to be clear that Nusra needs to be removed from the territory without civilian uh, casualties. And that, that remains to be the goal of the three sponsors, as well as, I hope, the, the three guarantors, as well as, I hope, that of the international community. 
Number two, uh, the political process uh, must uh, start and must come to fruition. We said from the very beginning, you all remember, that this conflict does not have a military solution. This conflict only has a political solution. We all need to accept that. But we all need to also accept the realities on the ground. The political process cannot reverse the realities on the ground. The political process needs to bring inclusion and everybody needs to be included in the political process and we are determined to help uh, Stefan as he proceeds with the constitutional framework in order to make sure that that political process leads to a comprehensive solution in Syria. Number three, uh, reconstruction and return of refugees is an important requirement now. It cannot wait for an eventuality that may be far too uh, ahead of us. We need to start now. Reconstruction, as I think I mentioned here last year, uh, should be a dividend for peace, not a dividend for victory. Peace dividends help Syrians come to end the war. Victory dividends help continue the war. I believe it is important for all of us to start helping Syrians as they go back to their homes. Voluntary repatriation of Syrians to their original homes, not to resettlement areas, is an important uh, requirement that we all need to start helping right now as it is taking place following liberation of certain areas from, from terrorist occupation. So these are important elements that we need to keep in, in, in mind. We in Iran, as well as in our role within the Astana process, will continue to help in whatever way we can. And again, I thank you very much for convening this meeting. Uh, merci, Javad. Je donne maintenant la parole uh, au secrétaire d'État uh, de la République française, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lemoy, et après uh, au Royaume-Uni. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Federica, for uh, this meeting. Mr. Special Envoy. The first priority uh, of France uh, in this conflict is to protect the, the civil population. And uh, we take note of uh, the agreement, uh, the memorandum uh, about uh, Idlib, and we will continue to support uh, Turkey effort in order to find uh, negotiate solutions for uh, uh, Idlib. Yes, there's an alternative to uh, escalation. Uh, they exist. Second, to uh, answer the humanitarian uh, emergency, uh, Brussels too was uh, uh, an important moment of mobilization and we welcome uh, the uh, conference Brussels 3 uh, next March and France will be uh, committed, uh, of course. Uh, third, uh, uh, the other priority for France in Syria is the fight against terrorism. We know what it is uh, in Sahel, for example, and we know uh, what it can imply, but we know also that it can't uh, justify any uh, massacres uh, that the regime uh, uh, can prepare. So, uh, in the Northeast, uh, um, we think that uh, we must uh, uh, work to stabilize the territories uh, freed from Daesh uh, and to avoid any uh, comeback of the terrorist organization. So in this context, uh, the comeback of refugees must be on a voluntary basis uh, with uh, uh, dignity and security conditions. And uh, we uh, know how we how is the burden for uh, neighboring countries such as Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq or Egypt and their generosity uh, honor them. But uh, now uh, we must be sure that the refugees can uh, be back with the, all of the rights, uh, their own rights. And the refugees uh, can come back only with a political transition. Um, and so the emergency is political, of course, and uh, we, we are very uh, glad to salute uh, the efforts of uh, Stefan de Mistura uh, in order to launch the Constitutional Committee. As he said, it is uh, the work for now, not for uh, tomorrow or, or, or next year. Um, so France's uh, commitment will be, uh, will be uh, very high uh, alongside uh, the European Union, the small group, uh, 
in order to have a political solution uh, in Syria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I now give the floor to the uh, UK, uh, Alistair Burt, and then to the United States. Uh, thank you, uh, High Representative, and I welcome the chance for us all to meet today. Thank you for your continuing commitment to convening us so we can all stand together in continued support of the Syrian people and calling for an end to this horrific conflict after nearly eight years of fighting and suffering. Firstly, today I want to talk about Idlib. Uh, the United Kingdom welcomes the encouraging news that Turkey and Russia have reached an agreement on the Northwest and the Russian commitment that the planned regime offensive will now not take place. I've been clear over recent weeks that the United Kingdom considers a human catastrophe in the region to be avoidable. And I truly hope that with this agreement, we've demonstrated that to be the case. And if this agreement is upheld, that we have averted massive human suffering. Perhaps it's also that political opportunity that something might open up. And we know how hard the special envoy is working for this, as his remarks today have made very clear. Secondly, I want to provide reassurance to the Syrian people of the United Kingdom's continued commitment to working with the international community to provide humanitarian relief for those in greatest need. Our commitment to this endeavor is unwavering, but it needs constantly said it's easy for the eyes of the world to move on. In order to ensure we can continue to deliver on this commitment, however, it is essential that our partners, be it the UN or NGOs, have safe and unfettered access to all areas of need. So I use this opportunity once again to call on the regime and its backers to ensure safe, sustained and unimpeded humanitarian access across all of Syria. Finally, I would like once again to thank those countries who are so generously hosting Syrian refugees who have fled violence and persecution in their own country, particularly Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. Your generosity is remarkable. It's truly recognized by the international community and commended by all. Regrettably, it's clear that the conditions are not yet in place for refugees to return to Syria voluntarily, with dignity, in accordance with international humanitarian law, and to respect the pressure that is placed on host communities. A political settlement remains vital to achieving this. We remain clear that we will not consider providing reconstruction assistance without such a settlement, while recognizing the distinction between stabilization and reconstruction. We are clear that without real change to address the root causes of this terrible conflict, reconstruction efforts would be rendered meaningless. So the United Kingdom will continue to use all diplomatic tools in pursuit of an inclusive political settlement, and we fully support and endorse once again the efforts of our UN Special Envoy, Stefan de Mistura. Thank you, and I'll give the floor uh, to the United States Special Representative for Syria, Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, followed by Qatar. Thank you, Madam High Representative. It is an honor to be here today. We commend the EU and its member states. <laughs> Chair, it is an honor to be here today. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It is an honor to be here today. We commend the EU and its member states for organizing this event and for their continued con contributions to the Syrian response. The humanitarian situation in Syria is heartbreaking. Furthermore, the danger of escalation remains real. Five major state forces are in close proximity in Syria, and any misstep risks touching off broader conflict. Those missteps include the use of chemical weapons <coughs> by regime forces. However, this is not only a moment of risk, but also a moment of opportunity. A potentially catastrophic offensive in Idlib has, as many of you have already mentioned, uh, for the time being at least been averted. President Trump in the General Assembly yesterday intentionally used much of his uh, speech to describe our policy on Syria in detail. First, de-escalate the military conflict. Second, use all the diplomatic tools at our disposal to reinvigorate the Geneva process and advance a political solution that honors the will of the Syrian people. That means help create a Syria that meets minimum standards for international recognition surrendering its chemical weapons, no longer posing a threat to its neighbors, severing its ties with Iranian expansionism, 
no longer sponsoring terrorism and treating its citizens humanely. Third, adopt a strategy to address Iran, the brutal regime that has fueled and financed the Syrian crisis. In our view, Iran and its proxies must leave Syria for there to be any lasting peace. As I said in the Security Council last week, Russia argues to the world that the Syrian conflict is ending and the situation is normalizing. We disagree. We do not think that recognition of the regime, soliciting reconstruction money, and pushing Syria's neighbors to send refugees home long before it is safe to do so is good policy. It essentially sweeps the past seven years under the rug. But the Syrian conflict has not ended, and the situation has not normalized. Conditions are not yet conductive for safe, voluntary, and dignified return of refugees. In addition, the humanitarian needs of the Syrian people and refugee-hosting countries remain immense. Within Syria, aid is still not reaching those who need it. The United States remains the single largest donor for the Syrian response, providing more than $8.6 billion in humanitarian assistance since the start of the crisis. To the governments of Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, I join my colleague from the United Kingdom in praising your generosity and hosting millions seeking refuge from this historic crisis. It is inspiring, and the international community will continue to support you. A future Syria will need reconstruction funding, but the Assad regime should get no help to rebuild Syria until it is on a path of genuine political reform in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. We must thus speak with one voice, not normalizing the Syrian regime by helping Assad rebuild the country until we see irrevers irreversible steps forward on a political process that leads to constitutional reform. UN supervised elections with diaspora participation in a political transition that reflects the will of the Syrian people. Here, one important first step would be for the UN Syrian envoy Stefan de Mistura uh, to convoke the Constitutional Committee uh, to quote our Turkish colleague without further delay and report back to the Security Council by the end of October. We need international and European Union support for such a position. Madam Chair, let me again thank you and the European Union for hosting this event. Thank you, and I'll give the floor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Qatar, followed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Al Thani, you have the floor. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Federica Magherini, the High Representative of the uh, EU for the uh, Foreign Political and Security Affairs. Mr. Stefan de Mastura, UN Special Envoy to Syria, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to express uh, our appreciation to the, to the United Nations and the European Union for holding this meeting. I would like to uh, thank uh, their efforts uh, with regards uh, to the Syrian crisis and their support uh, for the Syrian people uh, as they experience uh, this painful tragedy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Syrian crisis with its different dimensions uh, and its uh, different uh, implications, the current ones and the future ones uh, on international peace and security in the region and in the world has uh, given us uh, pause uh, and uh, has caused us much pain and shows the imbalance in the international order with regards uh, to uh, the uh, crimes uh, and uh, the behavior of the Syrian uh, regime uh, and its uh, daily violations against uh, the rights of its people, where it kills and destroys uh, and uh, forcibly displaces and changes the demographic character of areas and uses internationally banned weapons. Uh, international efforts uh, and political efforts to resolve this crisis continue to face obstacles due to the absence of international uh, conquered as well as uh, the uh, narrow uh, calculations uh, of uh, some. And, as, and this requires an international response, especially a response uh, from the permanent member states of the Security Council. They must uh, shoulder their legal and uh, moral and ethical responsibilities and must reconsider the strategy of dealing with this crisis so that we can find a peaceful resolution that would meet the aspirations of the Syrian people without any one-upmanship. And here we'd like uh, to once again uh, welcome the most recent Sochi agreement that helped uh, save uh, Mon uh, many millions uh, of uh, civilians from bloodshed in Idlib uh, and uh, who are between uh, the uh, a rock and a hard place between uh, the regime and the terrorists uh, and we confirm uh, that uh, this uh, uh, agreement must succeed uh, by being committed to all of its conditions and we would also like to support the political process that is being sponsored by the United Nations in order to arrive at a solution to the crisis. We would also like to welcome all international and regional efforts uh, that uh, enhance uh, and are in line uh, with uh, this uh, process in accordance uh, with international 
Economic Resolutions including Geneva 1 in 2012, which constitutes, in addition to Security Council Resolution 2254, these both constitute the main pillars of to find a fundamental solution to this crisis so that the Syrian people will determine their own fate while maintaining territorial integrity and sovereign independence for Syria. At the humanitarian level, it is unfortunate to see the continued suffering of the Syrian people. Without doubt, alleviating their suffering requires that the international community to uh, honor its humanitarian commitments uh, and uh, provide the necessary aid and take the required measures that would guarantee the implementation of Resolution 2156 of the Security Council, which discusses the facilitation of humanitarian aid from any party to all the harmed areas and affected areas in Syria, as well as providing aid to Syrian refugees in neighboring and hosting countries and offering the necessary financial aid to them. And here I'd like to note that Qatar has fulfilled all of its past uh, pledges uh, through its political discussions uh, and the uh, pledge conferences, the most recent of which uh, was Brussels to this year. The state of Qatar has spared no effort uh, in continuing uh, to offer all forms of support and aid to our Syrian brethren in coordination with our international partners. Ladies and gentlemen, with the continued grave violations but that the Syrian regime commits uh, of the humanitarian order and as is recorded by the United Nations in its reports, uh, the state of Qatar confirms the need to hold those perpetrating uh, such atrocities and war crimes and crimes against humanity in Syria since the beginning of this crisis to hold them accountable before international uh, justice and legitimacy. And here, Qatar continues to uphold its international responsibilities uh, along with the international community. It supports the international uh, independent uh, mechanism uh, to assist uh, in the investigation and uh, the prosecution uh, of uh, those responsible for perpetrating the most uh, serious uh, of crimes perpetrated in Syria since uh, uh, March 2011 as an element uh, that would help uh, arrive at a political solution to the Syrian crisis. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Adel Al Jubair. You have the floor, followed uh, by Jordan. Thank you, um, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Thank you, Federica, for convening this meeting, and thank you, Stefan, uh, for your enormous efforts and for your uh, most recent briefing. Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia believes in a political solution based on Security Council Resolution 2254 that protects the independence and territorial integrity of Syria and that leads to the removal of all foreign militias from Syria. We support the efforts of uh, the UN Special Envoy to convene the Constitutional Committee as soon as possible, and, and we believe that all of us must work together to uh, uh, encourage and pressure the regime to, to respond positively to this. Um, we have worked on unifying the Syrian opposition twice, uh, most recently in uh, bringing them together to support a political process without preconditions, and this was done at the what is known as the Riyadh 2 conference. We have uh, contributed $100 million in humanitarian assistance to the, liberated, to the areas liberated by the international coalition from Daesh. We have provided support for refugees in neighboring countries, and we have allowed more than 2 million Syrians to enter Saudi Arabia, of whom uh, more than 300,000 still remain, and none of them lives in a tent. Um, the custodian of the two holy mosques decreed that they be provided provided legal papers so they can have access to jobs, medical care, and health care, and we will continue to do whatever we, we can to support our Syrian brethren. Um, we also uh, look forward to working with the UN Special Envoy and the international community to extract Syria from this quagmire and to restore Syria's independence and protect its territorial integrity. And I think uh, it's very important for all of us to be pushing in the same direction in order to achieve that objective. Uh, thank you once again for hosting this meeting. Thank you. And I'll give the floor to um, the uh, Foreign Minister of Jordan, Ayman Safadi, uh, followed by Austria. Uh, thank you, Federica. Thank you all. Uh, and I just want to start by uh, stressing how important it was for us as a country that uh, uh, hosts about 1.3 million Syrians, almost 20 percent of the population, uh, uh, how important it was to get the support that you and the EU has provided. Uh, without the support from you and the rest of the international community, we will not have been able to do uh, what we've been trying very, very hard to do for the Syrian uh, uh, refugees, which is to provide them with a good shot at life, dignified life, and an opportunity to uh, grow and go to school and get the proper medical health. And our partnership with the UN has also been tremendous in enabling us to provide humanitarian supply, not just to refugees within Jordan, but also across border. Uh, and that 
that is something that we're, we're very proud of as well and we'll continue with our commitment to do that. Uh, that said, however, I, I must warn that the refugees are still there and their problems are still real. Uh, the second generation Syrians are now second graders in Jordan. Those who are 10 years old and uh, went to schools in Jordan are now either to go to university or uh, become uh, child labor uh, uh, with, with no opportunity to, to look for. And uh, in Jordan, no matter what, we will continue to provide uh, a school to every child. We'll continue to provide a, a dignified life to every uh, uh, young man or woman because we know the cost of not doing that is going to be a tremendous crime against those people, but also a tremendous threat to our collective security. Because if we provide Syrians with dignity, with a shot at education, with a decent life, they will be uh, the people who will go back and reconstruct Syria uh, when the time is right. And if we do not, they will be uh, frustrated young men and women. Uh, and, and this frustration is despair, as you all know, is the environment uh, which uh, every spoiler would want to use to uh, spread havoc against all of us. So it is important that we remain resilient. It is important that we continue to remember that the uh, conflict is still there and uh, our effort to support those people uh, are, 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 are a must. The second thing is, you know, it's almost deja vu when we, when we meet here. We all uh, uh, say what we come prepared to say. It is a crisis that has to end. We're all against a military solution. We all know that a military solution will not get us there. We all support a political solution, but the reality is very progress is being made towards really galvanizing our collective weight and ability and effort and really sit and focus and say, let us end this conflict. And when we say it is a political solution, we need to remember um, that a political solution should be first and foremost about the Syrian people and about Syria. This is what the conflict is all about. And unfortunately, in and all the sort of the crowdedness of efforts and talk and, and, and players, it seems that the Syrian people are really down the agenda and everything that's being discussed. So yes, we need a political solution, but the ultimate goal of that political solution should be to end the crisis, end the suffering, end the killing, end the marginalization. And to do that, we need to be realistic as well and see what is it that we can do and what is it that we, can, what we cannot do. We've lived with slogans for so long, and slogans resonate very, very well. But can we implement those slogans? And who is the victim of raising slogans that all of us know cannot be implemented? It is the Syrian people again. So I think you know, there, there is a need for a reality check. Let's get together, let's get towards a political solution, let's identify what is it that we want out of a political solution, and let's be realistic and resist sort of the, the, the charm of, you know, great moral statements, which we all would love to be able to, to hold up to, but if we cannot, what is more moral or what is, what is more immoral to allow a conflict to continue with all the destruction and killing that it's bringing to the Syrian people, or to say, you know, let's do what we can and gradually move towards a better situation, which should be a situation in which we preserve integrity, unity of Syria, preserve the dignity of the Syrian people, restore that country, restore peace, and allow the Syrian people to move forward and, and collect the, the pieces and, and, and move on together. And I think that is the question that we need to do. And that said, a realistic step is to support Stefan de Mistura and his effort. A realistic step is to go to Geneva, get the Constitutional Committee convened, and make sure that Geneva is not a one-off, one-on kind of exercise. We come for a week, we talk, then we go for three months, and in those three months, more people would have been killed, more people would have been displaced, and we're back. So I think what we need to do, if we all agree there's no military solution, let us just go to, do, to the Geneva, lock the door, and say, this is the mandate, this is what we need to do, and collectively put all our efforts and resources uh, to move forward to a solution. So the convening of that, of, of that committee is key as a practical first step to as a practical solution. Um, we've all mitigated crises that could have uh, uh, deteriorated into disasters. We've seen what happened in the South a couple of months ago, and, uh, and I have to say it was, you know, we worked with, 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 with Russia, and uh, we were able to produce reconciliation agreements that saved 
tens of thousands of lives. Uh, we continue to work within the framework of the small group with our American allies, with our European allies and everybody else and Arab, Arab, Arab brothers to try and, and come up with something. And we'll continue to do that. But I think what we need is clarity of objective, real, realism, and to make sure that we all remember that the ultimate goal is to save the Syrian and Syrian people, to immune them to the extent possible so much into uh, the damage that has been done, immune them from the struggle for agendas and the interest of everybody who's fighting everybody on Syria at the expense of Syria and the expense of the Syrian people. That is, that is something that we have to say. Another point I'd like to say, as, as again, as a country that is suffering from 18.4 percent unemployment, uh, it is in our interest to uh, uh, provide conditions conducive for the voluntary return of the Syrian people. And therefore, we encourage the voluntary, the voluntary return of the Syrian people. But you know what? It's going to come down to this. A father, a mother, and three kids having dinner if, if they can afford it. And they'll say, do we go back? And the question will be, will my kids be, be safe? Will I be able to put, put, food, uh, put food on the table? Will I have dignity? If the answer is yes, they will go. If the answer is no, they will not go. And, and the, uh, the answer to these questions will come from a cousin, a relative, a neighbor who will pick up the phone and say, come back, it is safe. Uh, to do that, I think we need to, again, differentiate between reconstruction and stabilization. Uh, we need to invest in stabilization because whether you're a kid growing under regime control or under opposition control, if you don't go to school 15 years, you are going to be a lost generation, whether we like it or not. So we have to provide schools. It doesn't matter where those kids are. By the end of the day, the children, they deserve education. We have to invest in that. We have to create an environment that would allow for those people to live in dignity. Because we spoke, we spoke on, on Daesh. Daesh is not totally gone. Yes, it lost its territorial control. But Daesh is still there. And if we do not address those conditions, Daesh will thrive on ignorance, despair, lack of, of sense of, 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 of dignity, and it will come back. So I think we need to look at the broader picture. Again, I want to thank you so much for, for this. I appreciate all you've done, and I, I hope we can continue to be partners in, in doing the right thing, humanitarian perspective and political perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, I would now give the floor uh, to uh, the Austrian Foreign Minister, Karin uh, Kneissel, uh, followed by Japan, Lebanon and Iraq. Karin. Federica Mogherini, uh, thank you for having convened that. It was a very uh, dear subject to us at our council meeting in Vienna, end of August, and I congratulate you and your colleagues that you could make it happen here today. And thank you for this very strong appearance of all the colleagues from the EU and beyond. Uh, I wish to second what my colleague from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan has said. It's all about reality check. We shouldn't get lost in semantics. The new catchword is stabilization. We were stuck with reconstruction. We were stuck with humanitarian assistance. But um, it is about what all what the Jordanian colleague has just stated, and I don't want to repeat on that. I would simply like also to state, having worked and lived in Syria for many years, I simply I am confident, I'm even optimistic that they will make it because it's the place where the soap has come from. Our civilization wouldn't be the one if Aleppo hadn't provided with us with soap. It's the place, Ugarit, where alphabet has come from. And it's where uh, the first big novels were written. And I know that the civilization can find comfort in history, despite all the hiccups that history can bring you with. But when you know that you're looking back to a strongly uh, stated civilization that has given so much to humanity, the universities of Aleppo and Homs and, and Damascus, they were the ones who brought the first chapters of the Mediterranean civilization, which later on became the European civilization. So whether this war is now ending or not, it's tea leaf reading for many of us. We have heard from Stefan de Mistura uh, in uh, 2017 that the war was about to end. Unfortunately, in between, we had other fights. Uh, as the US colleague has said, uh, maybe the war is not going to be ended so soon, but we should also not be stuck with that. Wars in our times don't end in a fully fledged way like the war of 1945 ended. That was a totalitarian war that ended because of extortion <laughs> by everybody. The Syrians are exhausted. Those who are not yet exhausted are the sponsors, 
sometimes behind the war here and there. But I hope that, uh, that we will see some sort of civil stabilization where people can go back Political perspective, as Stefan de Mistura has mentioned it uh, in our council meeting, is something. This cannot be assured, but it's all about the minimum services, water and electricity. And if you have only one or two hours of water a day uh, or, or electricity, you can make it because you will then arrange your day. That's the way people in the Middle East, whether they are in Baghdad or in Beirut, or whether they are in Gaza, they have made it somehow to survive also with a very limited time of electricity and, and uh, water. So I would like to, to go to what um, we, uh, from an Austrian perspective, would like to see happen in tandem with all what has already been mentioned when it comes to uh, political solutions, a new chapter. First, there has to be a disposal of the explosive remnants of war and mine clearance. Rockets, cluster munitions, other war relics, they are there. It has already been mentioned by the Russian uh, delegate what uh, the demining is done in the framework of its initiative of refugee return. Uh, two essential points have not yet been addressed, namely Syria has not signed so far the Ottawa Convention on the prohibition of interpersonal mines, and I think this would be a good moment to go that also in order to, to, uh, to accede to the conventions, both uh, on, cluster, uh, convention, uh, on cluster munitions and on uh, landmines. Second, we as the European Union, we are committed to strengthening what I just mentioned beforehand, this tremendous resilience of the Syrian population, uh, that uh, we should go as far as possible in our humanitarian assistance or call it stabilization, without changing our general position on reconstruction. And here, what would not be better than instead of concentrating on water delivery, we, we repair the water re distribution system. This has been done by courageous civilians here and there, by engineers who do it despite everything, by those who remained. But um, it requ um, in my view, the help on the ground and the reforms should go hand in hand. And water distribution, as to many other pressing needs that the Syrians face in order to live and to survive, and not to survive somehow, but to survive in dignity, that can be done. And I hope that in our meeting we can contribute, as the previous speakers in particular from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and many others have uh, addressed, reality check and not hiding behind mantras. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. I now give the floor to uh, the Foreign Minister of Japan, Taro Kono, followed by Lebanon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me begin by expressing my deep concern over the possibility of a large-scale military conflict in Idlib province. I am also concerned about the potential use of chemical weapons in Idlib which will never be tolerated under any circumstances. I appreciate the ongoing international effort to avoid a humanitarian disaster. I strongly support and will actively cooperate with the effort of Mr. Demistura, UN Special Envoy for Syria, including the establishment of the Constitutional Committee. It is important that the advancement of the political process lead to an environment where Syrian refugees in Europe and neighboring countries and interna internally displaced people are able to return to their homes voluntarily, safely, and peacefully. When the political process is advanced, Japan is ready to contribute to the reconstruction of Syria as a responsible member of the international community. Neighboring countries such as Jordan and Lebanon also need to be assisted for the regional stability. Japan's assistance to Syria and neighboring countries has reached over 2.2 billion US dollars since 2012. We are committed to delivering humanitarian assistance to all Syrians facing difficulties, no matter who controls the area. We also continue to provide assistance to Eastern Ghouta, South Syria, and Northwest Syria where needs of the humanitarian assistance are high. We will also provide assistance for displaced people from Idlib. To care for those who are most vulnerable in this conflict, 
Japan will devote even greater resources to women and health care. I am pleased to announce that Japan has recently dedicated approximately 10 million U.S. dollars for medical services for Syrian citizens and internally displaced people. I hope the next conference will take place in a more positive environment. Japan remains firmly committed to playing a leading role in both the humanitarian and political spheres in international efforts to solve the Syrian crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Taro. I now give the floor to the Foreign Minister of Lebanon, Gibran Basil, followed by Iraq. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, the situation has changed on the ground in Syria. Everybody admits this, but I think that we should act accordingly. We are still neglecting this fact uh, and trying to link the reconstruction of Syria and the return of the refugees to Syria with the political solution is an attempt that, allow me to tell you, will fail and will uh, appear to be useless later on. And why I'm saying this? Because thinking that having a leverage uh, using these two uh, issues in order to have a political solution will appear bit by bit that uh, it will not be very useful. A political solution in Syria will be reached, and Syria cannot live without a new constitution. We are uh, a neighboring country who suffered from a civil war, and we were not able to start our life again without having what we call the Ta'if Agreement, which is our constitution. In Syria, there has to be, nobody can ignore this, nor the regime, nor the opposition. They will have to reach, or life will be unbearable in Syria. And fight will keep on going uh, no, no matter what. But linking these two issues, let me, let me talk about the reconstruction first. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it is a sovereign decision by any country to decide not to participate in a country like Syria to finance any reconstruction uh, operation. But this will happen. And let me tell you that this is happening now. You will find countries willing to participate, and they are showing this. And you will have the private sector from your countries willing to, to participate, and they will do. So this for Lebanon is in our interest because Lebanon can be a pl platform for the reconstruction of Syria. After that, we paid at least direct cost of $20 billion on our economy. Our unemployment rate has moved from 9% to 20% in four years. So Lebanon uh, uh, will take advantage of this one once it happens. But this is not our main concern. You know, our main concern is on the refugees. And here again, we are using the same rhetoric of uh, the voluntary return of the, of the Syrians. And nobody, I believe, not in Lebanon at least, is talking ever about a forced return of the refugees. But we have to take this issue not as the whole. We have to divide it. First, there are the refugees who are uh, in our host countries for economic re reasons, and they are the majority. And this is shown, I, I, and I think you can check it any way possible. Second, you have the political refugees, and they are the minority, very little of them. And you have the security refugees. These are three categories. And on another hand, you have to treat them with those who are coming originally from safe regions now or not, who have their houses demolished or not, who have any uh, kind of uh, obstacles not allowing them to return, whether it is the military service, whether it is their right to property or, or whatever. So here, dealing with them in categories will allow them to have a gradual return that will take a long time, but that will uh, allow a country of Lebanon to, to live again. Telling us that we will link this to a political solution which, which is uh, indefinite in time, how can we know? Here we have uh, 
Cypriot friend who had his crisis since 1974, and until now, they are our neighboring country. They didn't come up with a political solution. And we have a worse case, which is that of the Palestinians. After 70 years, there is no political solutions, and we are trying to shut down UNRWA now by telling the Palestinians that you stay where you are, and you have no hope to, to return home. So for us, linking this to a political solution means that you are telling the Syrians, you stay in Lebanon, you stay in Jordan, you stay in Turkey. The more time passes, the more they will be integrated in, in our societies, something that we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot bear at all. So what I would like to suggest, and we had a fruitful conversation lately with HCR, and I think that moving first away from trying to discourage the Syrians from returning back home, because the financing of their stay in Lebanon, for example, is something that is hindering their return. We go to them, we ask them, you want to go back? They say yes. Why you are not going back? They tell you, we are paid for nutrition, for shelter, for education, for health. Why should we go back? If you provide this in Syria, definitely we choose to, to go back. So let's think of ways and find a way uh, an operating mode, you know, uh, a mechanism of allowing the Syrians, once they have all the needed conditions for their return, uh, to think how we can really finance the, this return. Because paying for them where they are is something that will never end. It is from the taxpayers that is really sometimes directed to people who are not in a really needy situation. So let's categorize them and see how we pay for those who cannot really return. Now you are paying for people who can really return to safe areas. They have no political problems. Their houses are safe. Their life is not jeopardized. They have no reason not to return. Their only reason is that they are paid to stay where they are. So dividing the problem like this, I think, will allow us to uh, having a gradual solution of the problem. And this will not, I believe, in any way encourage the Syrians not to dialogue and to really work for a, for a political solution. Holding this card will not really uh, uh, accelerate the political uh, solution. I hope that there will be an understanding of uh, our situation. Yesterday, President Trump himself said that the uh, best thing for the migrants is to stay at home because they will make their country great again. So I, I, I believe everybody will uh, realize sooner or later that this is the only solution or else as Lebanon is suffering, everybody will be suffering, maybe in a smaller scale and at a later stage. But you know how much Europe will be suffering from this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with this principle, New York would have missed uh, some uh, great uh, uh, mayors uh, that are uh, Italian origin, but that's another story. Uh, let me uh, give now the floor to the Iraqi uh, foreign minister, followed by Algeria. Uh, minister Al Jafari, you have the floor. Microphone, please. Microphone to Iraq. Uh, God, peace be upon you all. Allow me at the outset to thank the European Union and the United Nations for organizing this event uh, in order to provide support to the future of Syria and the region. We would like to thank uh, Madame Mogherini for her initiative, and we would also like to thank Mr. de Mistura, the international uh, uh, representative for Syria, to support the peace process led by the United Nations. We meet yet once again to discuss a very sensitive matter, the current 
unacceptable situation of the Syrian people, despite uh, the decrease of the military activities in the southern western part of Syria, because the government was able to recover uh, the territories that used to be controlled by armed conflicts and has been able to restore its sovereignty over these regions. Here, we would like to call upon all parties to respect their commitments under international uh, law and humanitarian uh, law to to guarantee the safety of civilians. We categorically reject all acts of terror. We believe that these are criminal acts that cannot be justified wherever and whoever committed them. And we believe that any uh, effort that are adopt, uh, that is adopted within uh, Resolution 2401 of 2018 that calls for combating the terrorist uh, groups defined by the Security Council to be able to separate them from uh, civilians. And we would like also to look into the respect uh, uh, of international law and protecting civilians. My country welcomes the agreement that was reached between uh, Syria and Turkey to establish a demilitarized uh, zone in the governorate of Idlib. The Sochi agreement is a result of uh, concentrated diplomatic efforts in Ankara and Damascus, which was followed by a summit among Iran, Russia, and Turkey in Tehran. The agreement uh, was based on the spirit of the Astana process and uh, the uh, approach to establish uh, de-escalation zones uh, in order to end the tension and limit the possibility of uh, injuring civilians uh, while combating terrorism. The Russian-Turkey agreement is also a step in the right direction and is compatible with the, uh, the efforts by Iran, Russia, and Turkey to cooperate in order to, uh, to combat all terrorists uh, while taking humanitarian considerations into account. Eight years have passed uh, uh, with with a military solution. What was the result? More bloodshed, more displacement, uh, more instability, and the negative impacts on the Syrian society. It also threatened the safety of uh, neighboring countries, uh, ending terrorism, uh, and violence would be one of the most important tenets of our foreign policy. Combating uh, terrorism requires a comprehensive approach that takes into account all the dimensions of this heinous phenomenon. We would like to stress yet once again uh, uh, the, the need to respect Syria's uh, independence and territorial integrity in a way that would allow Syria to control other uh, parts of its territories, which is its natural right, like any other state, Madam. Uh, uh, chairperson, the international community must welcome the agreement and contribute positively in its implementation. We hope that uh, this agreement uh, will uh, uh, will uh, will help in ending the uh, the tragedy of the Syrian people and to clear the country from uh, terrorist elements while taking into account humanitarian considerations. The return of uh, uh, displaced persons will uh, uh, will contribute to the ceasefire national dialogue and expedite the reconciliation process. It's very important to allow Syrians uh, to, to embark on a Syrian-led political process, uh, the right uh, to self-determination and to the determination of the, the right to the determination of the future uh, of Syria should be given to Syrians alone. Uh, we need to cooperate so that a committee, uh, a constitutional committee should be established. Uh, Syria is going through an, a very critical stage. Uh, the international community must stop, uh, must stand stand by stand uh, with Syria. And uh, the international community helped Iraq at some point, and we hope that it will do the same uh, for Syria. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Algeria. Je vais passer la parole au représentant de ministre des Affaires étrangères de la suivi par le Canada. Je voudrais tout d'abord. First of all, I would like to fulfill a pleasant duty that is incumbent upon me. 
As I was saying, I would like to acquit myself of a pleasant duty of uh, thanking you for having taken this initiative, as well as all of the other organizers, which has allowed us to uh, address this audience to share some uh, reflections on the Syrian crisis. Madam, over centuries, Syria was an example of living together against which no foreign occupation uh, was able to overcome. Today, there, it has pulled all of its people and all of its religious groups today. Unfortunately, this togetherness has exploded and been torn apart. We see the most uh, blood, bloody images of terrorism. I would like to reiterate in, on this, in this respect that under all circumstances, and this applies to Syria, the destabilizing factors lead to a deviation of the peace processes and undermine the peaceful solutions through inclusive dialogue and national reconciliation. I must underscore that the Syrian people also have the right, as all other peoples in the world do, to the respect of their sovereign will to freely decide their destiny. Therefore, it is fundamental that Syrians should own the definitive and lasting solution to this crisis, as my com comrade from Iraq has said, by placing the supreme interest of the country above all other concerns, collectively responding to the legitimate desires of this people to, leave in, to live in peace and security. It is in this regard that Algeria has provided its assistance to the UN and to the Astana process to lead to a peaceful process leading to a constructive dialogue between all the different Syrian interlocutors. Along these lines, I would like to reaffirm the support of the Algerians to the Syrian people in its fight against terrorism in order to hold on to its stability and its and the security of Syria, the union and the cohesion of its people. We must underscore the fact that the living situations and the weakening of the central authorities in certain countries have provided terrorists with an opportunity to occupy territories, to submit the civilian populations to barbarianism, to control the resources, to intensify and widen the scope of the criminal actions. As such, fighting against terrorism was always a threat that uh, no country has ever been completely protected against, and it remains a challenge that should concern the entire international community. Our efforts, ladies and gentlemen, must be part of a collective undertaking to assist and help Syria in its quest for stability and the respect of its sovereignty. So sovereignty and obviously to oversee the return of the refugees to their own country. Thank you for your attention. Ministre de la F des Affaires extérieures du Canada, Christian Freeland. Euh, et après, on va commencer euh, avec le segment euh, sur les questions humanitaires. Chers collègues, euh, Eric, merci d'avoir convoqué cette réunion. Euh, aussi, j'aimerais remercier l'envoi spécial en série de l'ONU, Stéphane Dimistour, qui n'est pas là, euh, mais pour son travail acharné. Uh, since the beginning of the war, the Assad regime has committed grave violations of international law. It has regularly bombed and indiscriminately targeted civilians, creating a massive refugee crisis with international repercussions. Worst of all, it has used chemical weapons against its own people. All of these heinous acts have been enabled by Assad's supporters, Russia and Iran. They share moral responsibility for them. As we speak, the people of Idlib are living in fear of a large-scale escalation of attacks from forces loyal to Assad. We pray for the sake of those who live there that the deal reached last week will hold. And it is an important achievement. But we mustn't be complacent and assume that it will. 
In looking ahead to Syria's future, I want to emphasize the importance of including Syrian women in the peacemaking process, including the constitutional process. Women's voices are essential in building a lasting peace. When faced with a situation as dire as Syria's, it is easy for those affected and for us, the international community, to fear that we are helpless to fix it. Canada, like so many countries here, has tried in small ways to make a difference. Since our government came to office, my country has welcomed more than 50,000 Syrian refugees. And I do, even as I mention that, I do want to say that that pales in comparison with the work of Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey in providing a home for Syrian refugees. And we salute that work. And I would really like to acknowledge that this is an international issue and we will continue to support you in doing that work. Inside Syria as well, there are countless people who are bravely working to make a difference. I cannot think of any group more courageous in this effort than the White Helmets. Their stated mission is to save the greatest number of lives in the shortest possible time and to minimize further injury to people and damage to property. That makes them heroes. It has also made them targets. I'd like to take this opportunity here to reject in the strongest possible terms the smears we have heard today about the White Helmets. Au sommet de l'OTAN à Bruxelles en juillet, le ministre Maas de l'Allemagne et moi nous sommes rendus compte que nous partageons une... We realized uh, that we share many preoccupations concerning the White Helmets. Jeremy Hunt, uh, le nouveau um, uh, ministre des Affaires étrangères des Royaumes-Unis, part... Uh, shares our concerns. So in collaboration with the Netherlands and Sweden and with the uh, vital assistance of Jord Jordan, Israel and the United States, we have sent 400 courageous white helmets along with their families, providing them with asylum. A Canadian journalist wrote the following, saying the white helmets would be exemplary Canadians, and I am absolutely in agreement with this. Uh, these are very few people to deal with the tragedy of Syria, but it is better to light a single candle than to remain in obscurity. This is what we have undertaken. Congratulation. Although I do want, especially today after we've heard, to underscore our very strong support and admiration for the work of the White Helmets. But I do tell this story to demonstrate that working together it is possible for us to act on our values and to make a difference, however small. We have to harness this energy as we continue the difficult work of negotiating an enduring political solution to the Syrian crisis and holding those responsible for atrocious and barbaric acts to account. We must remain firm and steadfast in our resolve to do what is right and ultimately to help the people of Syria to win the peace and justice that they deserve. And I am very glad that Stefan de Mistura has returned, so I can directly thank him for his extremely hard, indefatigable, and courageous work on this issue. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Federica. Now, we are going to the humanitarian part of our event. Distinguished members of the panel, dear colleagues, dear friends, once again, thank you for being here today. Eight years after the beginning of the conflict, as Stefan de Mistura already insisted on this, Syria remains, allow me to say this, an open humanitarian wound. Each new escalation triggers tremendous humanitarian needs and human suffering. The war, as we already admitted, is far from over. And a political solution is more urgent than ever. As I, I recognize all of us, we agree on this. The European Union remains concerned about the situation in Italy. Following the recent agreement between Turkey and Russia, and Federica and Stefan already supported this agreement, and the 
is this fact to create a demilitarized buffer, we must ensure the protection of the nearly 3 million civilians living in the province and their unbeaten access to humanitarian assistance. Regardless of what happens, protection of civilians must be central. To respond to needs, we have updated our contingency planning and strengthen our preparedness to act swiftly and meet the needs of affected population in the region. But our efforts will be wasted without humanitarian access. Most importantly, we must never give up on those seeking a political solution. Protection of civilians is our biggest humanitarian challenge. And our partners, our humanitarian partners here, they will describe with clear words and sentences about the situation on the ground. I would like to say a few words about the situation inside Syria. The millions of civilians in hard to reach areas. The civilian infrastructures, schools, hospitals, which is targeted on a regular basis. The millions of internally displaced and their hosts. As I said, access is our biggest challenge. For aid workers operating in Syria, unfortunately, humanitarian workers and assets are constantly under attack. This is the hard reality on the ground. Region in Syria changed hands, but humanitarian needs remain the same. I want to be clear on this. We cannot afford a humanitarian vacuum in the country. All parties to the conflict must respect international humanitarian law. They must protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. This is the message just already Stefan de Misura already sent to all of us. And of course, allow aid workers to do their job in security and in safety. Dear colleagues, protection, our number one challenge, not only in Syria, but across the region. This is particularly true in countries hosting more than five and a half million Syrian refugees. Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. They are the pillars of the humanitarian response to the conflict in Syria. Without an inclusive, viable political solution, displacement and suffering will continue. Our top priority is to cover the pressing needs of 13 million affected people inside Syria. We must continue delivering aid with humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. This is our humanitarian principles. It is vital that we all remain at the forefront of the humanitarian response in Syria and the wider region. And it is essential that we all stay on the track of the Brussels Conference in 2017 and 2019, honoring our humanitarian commitments and translating our promises into real, concrete solidarity so desperately needed by millions of innocent in Syria. And of course, as Federica already announced, we will continue our efforts in the next summit in uh, next year. Of course, our hope is to see political solution until this date. But until then, we have to continue, especially our humanitarian efforts, in order to reduce the suffering of these people in Saint Syria. Thank you so much. And now, I have to give the floor to Mark. And thank you for your presence here and for your efforts to do our um, thank you very much indeed, um, Federica Christos. I'm, I'm conscious that time is uh, our enemy in this discussion. We don't have much longer, and, and Christos has done a fantastic job in setting out the overall humanitarian context, and we uh, update all the um, member states every month on that uh, through the Secretary General's report and through the briefing I do to the Security Council. So to, I'd just like to make three key um, points, given the limited uh, time available. Firstly, while the, the situation across much of Syria is calmer now than it was um, certainly at the beginning of this year or the peak of the fighting, um, there are some very real remaining risks. Last week did offer um, potential good news for those three million civilians in Idlib, and let's remember that most of those people are people displaced from other parts of the country, a million of them are children, and those civilians outnumber fighters by an estimated 100 to 1. Um, 
So the, the agreement reached between, um, as a result of work by Turkey and Russia, is an extremely important uh, agreement. But the central issue is whether it's going to be fully implemented and whether the agreement lasts not just for a few weeks but permanently. Um, because it needs to be a permanent agreement if that catastrophe we've been warning of in Idlib is to be uh, a genuine, genuinely avoided and we're, we're to provide genuine hope for those, uh, those people. So everything has to be done to make, the, um, make sure the agreement is um, fully implemented and the risks are enormous. And um, as Stefan has said, terrorism needs to be addressed in a way which is consistent with international humanitarian law. Civilians have to be respected and protected, principal humanitarian action must be facilitated and humanitarian access through the most direct routes including the cross-border operations, must be sustained. Secondly, those principles also apply in other parts of the country. And I want to say a word about Rukban, close to the Syrian Jordanian border, where the, the humanitarian situation has deteriorated significantly over the last month with reports of deaths and malnutrition and increased insecurity and extremely limited supplies of basic goods. The last UN food delivery to the camp from the Jordanian side of the berm took place nearly nine months ago. Community leaders are now reporting that families are surviving on one meal every two days. Um, and we've had long-running discussions about providing uh, relief assistance to those communities um, by convoys from Damascus. And it's now urgent that those discussions are concluded successfully and rapidly so that help can reach those people. Um, otherwise, we will, have a, um, we will have a very dramatic situation. The third point I want to make is, is um, that in face of the enormous challenges, humanitarian organizations do continue to assist millions of people, both inside Syria and in neighboring countries, um, every month. And that is only possible because of the generosity of international donors, who've provided more than $8.5 billion uh, for UN-coordinated humanitarian activities inside Syria since 2012. It is critical that limitations imposed on our ability to independently assess needs and to deliver aid to the most vulnerable are lifted so that we can ensure principled and accountable aid operations. Those limitations are the fundamental constraints at the moment on resource mobilization. Lifting them would help restore donor confidence and assure both current and potential donors that help is genuinely targeted in a neutral and in impartial way on the people in, in greatest need and indeed that that help reaches those same people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And because the time is li really limited, I now give the floor for another briefing by Filippo Grandi, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Thank you, Filippo. I guess this meeting was supposed to be us briefing you and then you commenting, but since everybody has commented already on <laughs> refugees, let me comment back to you. Uh, and uh, two points only in the interest of time. First, um, just to make clear UNHCR's position. Our position recognizes that refugees have the fundamental human right to return in safety and dignity at the time of their own choosing. And we support all action that contributes to the full exercise of that right. So the free and informed decision of Syrians to return remains from the point of view of principles key. And uh, fundamentally, this is what Minister Safadi, the Ayman said earlier about the process of decision making by refugees themselves. And this is, by the way, consistent with our position on voluntary return in any situation of refuge. Now, what refugees tell us in the countries of asylum uh, is that there are certain concerns that they have. They belong to three areas. One is security, the other one is material needs, and the third one is a complex set of legal and administrative issues, ranging from property issues to a fear of lengthy conscription and fighting, to documentation, 
to retribution and so forth. And we will continue to work. You know, we are not about putting conditions. We will continue to work with all of you to address these obstacles so that voluntary so that that choice that people have to make becomes becomes possible and for those who do make the decision to return there are not many but there have been some and many more among the internally displaced people we will have to provide humanitarian assistance and assistance to the initial reintegration just a few more words to echo all those that have thanked once again the host countries Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and Egypt, and other countries. Uh, we should not forget that this is still the largest refugee population in the world, 5.6 million people. And I think that we should not say thank you to the host country and take it for granted all the time. That thank you has to be substantive, not formal. And I do thank donors through the only the refugee appeals of the UN, we have mobilized over the many years, unfortunately, $13 billion. Unfortunately, it is not enough. This year, the appeal is only 41% funded, and we are towards the end of the year. 80% in average of the refugees live below the poverty line. 35% of the refugee children are still out of school, and this exposes them to exploitation, early marriage, and all forms of discrimination. And it has a very heavy impact on uh, host countries. So the commitments made first in London in 2016 and reiterated in Brussels in other, in, in other conferences must be maintained, not only through humanitarian assistance, but medium and longer term assistance. And finally, may I also make an appeal to all countries that have resettlement programs for Syrian refugees to maintain those programs because they are a small but significant gesture of solidarity with countries hosting refugees. Let me just conclude by thanking Federica and uh, Christos for hosting us here and welcoming very much the information that we received that there will be a conference in Brussels in which I hope we will already be at a stage of the political process where we can move forward with the aid discussion uh, to new areas. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo, for your clear briefing and clear message. Now, um, the administrator of UNDP, Mr. Steiner, for another briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Christo. Thank you, Federica. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, together with um, Mark and Filippo, I join this morning's discussion fully conscious of many fine lines, many timelines, many red lines that have been articulated in the response of the international community in the context of developments within and also around Syria. I want to also commend and thank um, our colleague, uh, the Special Envoy, Stefan de Mistura, for promoting the peace talks under the UN Security Council resolution as Mark and Filippo have highlighted, the current plight of Syrians requires a sustained effort both on the humanitarian and resilience fronts inside Syria as well as in neighboring countries. The United Nations Development Program is committed uh, to complement the important work of our humanitarian colleagues by the nature of our mandate and to help strengthen local level community resilience within the framework of the humanitarian response plan. Throughout our work, UNDP adheres to and is aligned with the principal approach led by the UN Secretary General on Syria and focuses on localized, conflict-sensitive, people-centered activities in two key areas, rehabilitation of local services and support to emergency livelihoods. Despite the many challenges and thanks to the support of our generous donors that both of my colleagues have already referred to, we have so far this year reached over 2.1 million people as beneficiaries. Overall, our activities aim at reinforcing the sustainability of life-saving humanitarian interventions by building resilience of individuals and communities and enhancing their ability to take part in recovery once this process starts. It is important to remember that Syria is made up of 17 million Syrians that continue to struggle to find peace and livelihoods and where, according to our United Nations assessment, 69% 69% of the population have fallen into extreme poverty. 
They deserve our undivided attention and support, and supporting these communities is also key to planning for the expected return of refugees and the more immediate challenge of IDP returns. I also want to echo with great admiration my colleagues' expression of the gratitude that we feel towards the countries of the region, in particular Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey, as well as Iraq and Egypt. The regional refugee and resilience plan, the so-called 3RP, co-led by UNDP and UNHCR, continues to be a cornerstone of international support to assist these countries. Without going into details, all three representatives have this morning alluded to the enormous challenges they face and the enormous pressures under which the international support is currently being deployed. This, this year, the total 3RP appeal amounted to $5.6 billion, with 41 percent of the interagency ask dedicated to resilience. So far, only 42 percent of the 3RP's appeal has been funded, with the resilience component chronically underfunded. I appeal to all partners to lend their support through the voices, the examples and the pressures that are being felt by the countries who have spoken here this morning. Meanwhile, and Christos, I end with this, it is also critical that efforts aimed at responding to the refugee crisis are closely tied to actions aimed at addressing wider developmental challenges. Lebanon and the international community have paved the way for this approach with the CEDA conference. A similar event is being planned in Jordan in the coming months. UNDP stands ready to support these efforts. In conclusion, and despite the many and significant challenges inherent to the Syria crisis, I am grateful that our collaboration has led to the practical implementation of the humanitarian development nexus, so often invoked, constantly part particularly of Marx and my endeavors in leading a UN system that is joined up but not naive nor blind to the complex political territory in which we move and I try to live up to the commitment of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Thank you for your contribution, not only through this briefing, but for your organization on the ground. Now, President of ICRC, Mr. Peter Mauer. Dear colleagues, as the Syrian conflict moves into a protracted situation with fewer or less visible front lines, we hope that some people will have the chance to start rebuilding their lives. Our humanitarian action will support them on both sides of the current or former front lines. It will strive for sustainable humanitarian impact to build on people's industriousness and to strengthen their capacity to overcome adversity. While the international community will have to answer difficult questions, and we have heard it this morning about the long-term reconstruction of Syria and the political conditions humanitarians still need to respond to people's needs and their wish to live with dignity. They cannot wait for political consensus. We will work to support people in rebuilding their houses, their basic infrastructures, to find jobs and economic opportunities, to searching for missing relatives and reminding the authorities of the obligations towards their own citizens. In particular, we will have to address the humanitarian consequences of some of the most devastating impacts of urban warfare in Syria, just as we do and would in Mosul, in Sada, or in Gaza. Our action will not be motivated by political considerations, but based on independent and impartial assessments of the humanitarian needs of individuals and communities. Importantly, humanitarian action for people in Syria should not be held hostage to controversies about return. The legal situation is clear. People who have been forcefully displaced have a right to return in safety and dignity. They also have a right not to be returned to situations where the rights are at risk. Humanitarian action can contribute to help return IDPs and refugees to recover their lives, just as it seeks to support those who have stayed without, however, being used as a fig leaf to return people forcefully. We cannot forget that the conditions for IDPs and refugees to return do not merely depend on repaired water systems, but on safety and respects for their rights. Dear colleagues, humanity is not measured by the tons of relief items shipped and distributed, but by the recovery of people in need, by the recovery of grieving families of missing persons, those left detained, children who have never known a life without war. The children and families of foreign fighters recently visited by our teams 
also cannot be forgotten and deserve humanity. Children need to have access to education and psychological support. They need to have a future. We will continue to seek access to all detainees and we are setting ourselves up to help authorities tackle the daunting caseload of missing persons which will continue to haunt the region for decades to come. This lies at the heart of our mandate given to us by the international community. We will continue to engage with all parties to the conflict to try to build a constructive dialogue about respect for international humanitarian law and the protection of the civilian population. I thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Now the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary and following Norway. Thank you for the uh, floor. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, I would like to um, touch upon an aspect uh, of this um, crisis, uh, which aspect uh, has been addressed uh, barely and unacceptably barely, which is the destiny of the uh, Christian communities living or used to be living in uh, Syria. We barely speak about them, although we speak a lot about diversity, multiculturalism, the colorfulness of this region, but we hardly speak about the Christians. This uh, portrays a um, approach which uh, kind of says or suggests as if Christianophobia would be the last acceptable form of discrimination, which we definitely find unacceptable and we reject that. If we take into consideration the um, fact that four out of all five persons on the globe who are tortured or killed because of his or her belief are Christians, we have to take this issue seriously into consideration. And in the Middle East, including in Syria, there's a real threat that the Christian communities will be eliminated. And I'm speaking about those Christian communities who have been living in the neighborhood not only for centuries, but for a millennium already. Their houses are torn down, their schools are closed, churches are torn down, hospitals cannot operate. Since I'm representing a, a Christian country, we feel responsibility to protect these Christian communities. In our government, Your Excellency, Mr. Commissioner, we have uh, established a separate state secretariat which has the only, only obligation to monitor the situation and the destiny of the Christian communities worldwide who are in need. We have allocated and spent 15 million euros on reconstructing the torn down houses of the Christian families to rebuild their churches, to strengthen their communities and to rebuild their schools. We have donated uh, almost two and a half million dollars to the uh, Greek Catholic Archdiocese of Aleppo to carry out uh, their projects to rebuild the houses of those Christian families who can return to their homes. We have been supporting the humanitarian actions of the Syrian Orthodox Church to be able to take care of the Christian uh, refugees. Mr. Commissioner, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I think we have to uh, make it sure that we, do our, we make our best in order to make it possible for the uh, Christian communities which had to leave their homes to be able to return. Sometimes we have the experience that even on the deliberated areas, it's impossible for them to return because of legal and physical reasons. I think UN should guarantee, and here European Union should play a role, I think UN should guarantee legal and physical security for these families who were forced to leave their homes to, able, to be able to return. Mr. Commissioner, we Hungarians are ready to take part in this endeavor in order to make it possible for the Christian communities to continue their lives in Syria and in the Middle East where they have been living for not only centuries but for a millennia and from where they were forced to live. Thank you very much. And now the representatives of the civil society organization, Mr. Husni Al Barazi. Thank you so much for your presence here. It's very important for us to hear your voice and to see your opinions, especially because you can represent the situation on the ground. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, good morning to the dignitaries. I guess the biggest thing I've been asked to come forward today and speak to you on behalf of the NGOs is to keep it positive because it's a topic that is very troubling. As NGOs working in Syria and the region, we wish to thank the EU for the opportunity to address the UN member states today. I come to you, as been cited earlier, from the heart of civilization and the epicenter of religions, tolerance and coexistence. I come to you from Syria. I may be one of the few from Syria representing the voices of millions of my fellow citizens whose lives have been shattered and for many words can't describe their pain. No words of their expressed outrage, no words can express their despair. But we're hopeful and we're resilient as has been stated earlier. I believe Madam Marie indicated earlier this morning that we should talk to Syrians versus talk about Syrians and I thank her and the European Union to allow us the space today. One ask, I was requested to speak from the heart. As I look in the room, a lot of professionals, a lot of degrees, a lot of smarts. I'm just a humble young man from the city of Hama. For that, allow me to speak to the heart. For all the declarations and the resolutions that have passed in the last seven years, a military approach this conflict endures. Millions of Syrians are deprived of their rights and remain in need of critical life-saving humanitarian assistance. But more importantly, dignity has been lost. Let me raise my voice and ask to the parties to this conflict and member states with influence over these parties, whether in Astana, Geneva, or through the UN Security Council, you have committed to improving the humanitarian access and relief. Can we ask you to respect and enforce those pledges? Can we expect you to take concrete steps to improve compliance with the international humanitarian law and end impunity for the violators? Equally stop the attacks on schools and hospitals protect our colleagues on the ground. Too many have died, my own organization have suffered, often targeted precisely because of the work they do, and they should not be criminalized to the sole basis of humanitarian service. Today, I take this podium and salute their sacrifices and honor their memories. The second mandate of my speech was to keep it positive, as I indicated earlier. Despite the member state differences, you have already agreed to these commitments. Now we count on you to translate your intentions into facts on the ground. I think to attribute to what stated earlier by the Special Envoy de Mistura, the recent agreement in Idlib could prove to be a turning point. At the very least, it provides a reprieve for the children and their families, millions of whom have been living in fear of a major eminent military offensive. But we must build on this diplomatic progress to agree a permanent ceasefire hudna that spares people in Idlib and across Syria for further violence and suffering and displacement. Millions also continue to need our support and assistance in neighboring countries. Let us not forget that today. Conditions for those safe, voluntary, and dignified return of refugees remain elusive and are unlikely to be met in the near future for a variety of reasons. No one should be forced to return. Any organized large-scale repetition of refugees from neighboring countries now would risk being unsustainable and creating yet more internal displaced people, as well as refugee flows back to, into host countries and onwards to Europe and elsewhere. 
I think the international community must step up and continue its support to the host governments in the region. The UN and the civil society to deliver a response to refugees and host communities that could be sustainable while those in need continue to require our help, as well as mitigate tensions. To do this effectively, Commissioner, we count on your support on a multi-year donor funding is part of the essential success. In order to improve the quality of asylum in host countries, the important policy commitment made at the Brussels II conference earlier this year require dogged follow-up. It must be worked. Finally, Syrians across the region have little faith left in the international system designed to protect them and support. Syrians deserve to have their dignity back. We must not let them down. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you so much for your contribution and your organization. But unfortunately, I have this but privilege to stop this event, this excellent exchange of views, because uh, for the next uh, meeting here. And uh, sorry, but uh, as you know, as always in this event, the time always is limited. And due to shortage of time, the event secretariat will be collecting your statements for posting on the event's internet site. Thank you so much again for this uh, excellent exchange of views. And uh, we will see again in Brussels next year, maybe in a completely different circumstances. Thank you so much.